Good morning and welcome to the NWR Small Cap Virtual Conference. Up next, we have Calix. Uh, we have the Managing Director and CEO, Phil Hodgson. Calix has developed a patented technology platform to provide industrial solutions that address global sustainability challenges. The core tech is being used to develop environmentally friendly solutions for advanced batteries, crop protection, aquaculture, waste and water, and most importantly uh, for this presentation, carbon reduction. Calix has identified key global changes challenges that have emerged in the last decade and are increasingly putting our planet at risk. By aligning innovation and development initiatives with the SDGs, Calix is driven to make an impactful and meaningful contribution to solving global challenges. Joining us today from Calix, as I said, is Phil Hodgson. Phil joined as the CEO in 2013, was appointed the director in 2014 and is a member of Calix's technology committee. Phil's technical and commercial background is from a successful career with Shell, where for more than 14 years he developed significant depth of experience across all sectors of the downstream oil industry, including refining and supply, marketing and sales, pricing strategy, risk management, corporate strategy, and M&A. Phil, I'll now hand it over to you. And just a reminder for those uh, that are watching, uh, feel free to send through questions via the Q&A box down the bottom, uh, the more the merrier. Thanks, Phil. Excellent. Thanks very much, Simon. And, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. And uh, allowing me to talk to you about uh, Calix. Um, I'll just move through to a quick overview of the business first. Uh, Calix uh, is an Australian technology company, uh, originally uh, uh, concentrating on a mineral processing technology, but expanding out now into uh, wastewater treatment, et cetera, all from products from, from that original technology. Uh, we've managed to uh, get a reasonable footprint around the globe as well. So uh, certainly uh, before we IPO'd about two years ago, we'd started establishing some business in Southeast Asia. Uh, we're also just recently purchased a business in the US to assist with our market entry there. Again, mainly focused around wastewater treatment. Uh, and also we've got uh, some very interesting projects uh, that we're developing in Europe. And I might take most of this presentation to talk about some of those projects in uh, CO2 mitigation in the lime and cement industry. Uh, just in terms of the, the sort of shape of the business, if you like, um, we are revenues, uh, we ha have growing revenues. We've got uh, uh, that US acquisition certainly boosted up our revenue, the revenue side of the business uh, and our guidance that we gave as at February in terms of total revenues for the year of around 12 and a half to 14 million Australian dollars. Uh, we remain firm on our guidance, uh, which will be a revenue growth of between 280 and 320% year on year. So um, certainly the revenue side of our business is growing very nicely. Uh, we do have control of our supply chain. So we do have a mine here uh, in Australia, in South Australia, uh, where we mine a raw material that goes into our wastewater treatment products. Uh, we've got uh, a pretty good funded development pipeline as well. So when uh, I talk a bit about the CO2 part of the business, which, which will be the main part of today's discussion, uh, there's a lot of funding that's come into that business from uh, Europe, for example, where those two projects uh, uh, are now uh, up and running. Uh, and also the business model as a whole is pretty quickly scalable. So uh, the, the production facilities that we have in place in Bacchus Marsh are currently only 15% utilised. So there's, there's plenty of scalability left in the business as well. So overall, we're, we're a cash flow positive business. We've got virtually no debt. Uh, we've got growing revenues, uh, a secure supply chain, uh, and we're pretty quickly scalable with a funded development pipeline. Just in terms of the capital structure of the company, uh, we listed the company, as I said, in July 2018. Uh, all of the shares, uh, any escrowed shares have now come out of escrow uh, post that IPO. Uh, so at the moment, the free floats about 100, the full 147, uh, 147 million shares. Uh, if you can have a look at the uh, capital structure of the company, you can see board and management are at around 17.5% of the equity. Uh, that's uh, a lot of that is money that we put in ourselves into this company. Uh, you can see some of the shareholders in the company, uh, some good institutional support, so perennial. Um, we've also got uh, Australian Super, Thorny and Acorn, who also uh, have come into the stock, both pre and then post IPO. So. Uh, Overall, the company, as I said, is, is pretty debt free. We've got a good amount of cash uh, and um, uh, overall uh, uh, the market cap is sitting at around 113 million at the moment. Okay, just in terms of the existing market, sorry, just uh, bouncing around a bit there, existing markets for the technology. 
Uh, the revenue part of the business uh, is focused on water and wastewater, and uh, and that's the bit where we've purchased that US acquisition uh, that's really starting to grow quite nicely for us in terms of revenue. Uh, that Southeast Asian business I mentioned before uh, is really focusing on aquaculture and freshwater lake remediation, uh, and uh, that was going quite well into China until the recent COVID crisis, uh, not materially affecting our revenues, but just interrupting the momentum there a bit. So we're hopeful that that'll get back on track once uh, once uh, China gets back on track. Uh, just in terms of agriculture and crop protection, uh, the same uh, product moving into agriculture and crop protection there based upon our, uh, our supply chain of magnesium hydroxide. Uh, and that piece is uh, moving through its first commercialization phase in Europe. Uh, so the first sales, if you like, into agriculture and crop protection of, uh, of magnesium, hydro our magnesium hydroxide product. The product that I'm going to focus on, though, uh, the application, if you like, is CO2 mitigation in lime and cement. Uh, and that's where we've got a pilot plant up and running in Belgium and a second project that we've just announced. Uh, we also have uh, another part of the business looking at advanced batteries. Uh, and how can one technology touch all these verticals? I'll briefly talk about that. But just to go sorry, in line. Sorry, Phil. Yeah. Sorry, Phil, just, just before you continue, if you just, uh, just pull the mic uh, that's rubbing against your shirt, just so it doesn't... Uh... Um, just keep it keep it off your shirt. Yeah, we'll sorry about good. that. I've I've got um, uh, tree lopping happening in the background. I thought I'd come into the office where no, all good. Right, so I got the mic uh, instead of using the computer audio. So hopefully everyone can hear me. <laughs> okay, that's, that's better. All good. All good. Excellent. Righto. The CO two problem. Uh, if I talk about the lime and cement uh, application of the technology, and I think about the problem associated with CO two, uh, basically about half the weight of a lump of limestone. Uh, is CO2. Uh, so if you go back to your high school chemistry, limestone is calcium carbonate. Uh, and what they do to make lime and cement is they heat that up. And a lot of people think the emissions coming from the lime and cement industry associated with all of that heat. Well, quite a bit is, about one third. Uh, but in fact, once that uh, calcium carbonate breaks down into lime, which is calcium oxide and CO2, that CO2 that's released is in fact two thirds of the emissions of the lime and cement industry. So it's coming from the rock itself. Most of the CO2 is coming from the rock, not from the heating process. And so that's what makes the lime and cement industry so CO2 intensive. In fact, uh, they're the highest industrial emitter uh, of CO2 in the world. Uh, and of course, cement and lime, uh, it's one of the most utilized substances on earth. Only water is used, used more than these substances. So it's a very big problem. Uh, and it's a very big contributor to uh, CO2 emissions. In terms of what our technology can do about that, uh, the technology is basically a new type of kiln, uh, and there's a, a diagram of it there. Uh, in most kilns, you heat, uh, uh, use fuel to, to burn, and that those hot gases come in contact with whatever it is you're trying to process. With our technology, we separate that. We have heat coming from the outside. We have a central reactor tube. We heat that tube. Uh, and then as the material just sort of flows down, it just falls down as a fine powder through the tube. That's what imparts the heat onto that powder. Uh, and so that's what our technology does. Um, now, there's a couple of things that does. Uh, uh, when we're trying to concentrate and make very high surface area or active minerals, uh, which is the case for our wastewater treatment business, for example, and a few other things, we can make very, very high surface area materials. And those materials are going into all of those verticals that you see there, wastewater, aquaculture, lake remediation, et cetera. But if you think about the tube itself, uh, if you're using limestone and those limestone particles are falling down through the tube and that CO2 is coming out of those particles, then obviously that CO2 is just trapped in that tube. And in fact, in our technology, it makes its way back, back up to the top and you can see here, uh, the CO2 comes out the top as a pure stream. That's what's of interest to the cement and lime industries because as we said before, a lot of their CO2 is coming out of the rock and our uh, technology is a chance to trap that CO2 for them. And that technology we're calling lilac, low emissions intensity lime and cement. And that's this other vertical uh, that the technology can be applied to. Let's keep moving. I just want to give you an idea of the size of the opportunity in the cement and lime industries now. Uh, if our technology was applied to a million tonne cement plant, so a million tonne cement plant sort of the average size of a cement plant. If our technology was applied to a million tonne cement plant every three to four days till 2050, we would still not supply enough technology into that space for them to hit their targets of net zero CO2 by 2050. So that's how big the problem is. That's how many cement plants there are out there. Uh, and so that's uh, 
obviously a, a very big opportunity for this technology. So where are we with the development of the technology? Our initial plant uh, that we built for a magnesite, uh, a different mineral based upon magnesium, uh, we completed in 2013, uh, cost us about 18 million Aussie in capital. Uh, we've had over seven years of operation on that plant with minimal uh, maintenance and OPEX. Uh, and that basically to do the same reaction for magnesite, we're going to heat it to about 760 degrees. Uh, the application cements a little trickier. We're going to heat that up to about 960 degrees, but we've now done that. Uh, that's a little plant we've built there, right next to a Heidelberg cement plant in Belgium. Uh, it's doing about 5% of the throughput of the cement plant, but we can get it to 960. Uh, we've got 95% purity CO2 coming out the top. We've achieved about 70% of the maximum throughput of that plant, uh, and we're pushing that plant through to the operational limits through to the end of 2020. So we're gradually trying to get the heat up and the throughputs up uh, even higher, uh, but already we've uh, proven the technology concept. Uh, and we're proving it to the extent that the EU has decided to give us another $27 million, along with $15 million from industrial partners, to scale that technology up fourfold, to go from uh, what is effectively 5% of the throughput of a cement plant up to 20% uh, of the throughput of a cement plant. And that little diagram there you can see, uh, there's two plants. You can see the little lilac plant there, if you like, next to the, the big Heidelberg cement plant. And then the scaled up version is sort of four lilacs together. We're already in planning for a full-scale plant. This plant would take uh, up to 500,000 tonnes of CO2 separated from a million tonne cement plant. And you can sort of see the schematical footprint of what that plant would look like there. Uh, and so with Lilac 2, uh, we're fully funded to that demonstration scale. Uh, that plant is designed to be completed by 2023. Uh, we test runs through to the end of 24. And then the full scale or Lilac 3 is in planning, planning, uh, as I say, and that one we're targeting the EU or the US for that particular plant. Just in terms of who we're working with, uh, you can see there a big list of, of, of uh, our industrial parties, uh, some of the biggest lime and cement companies in the world. Interestingly enough, Engie, one of the largest e electricity utility companies is there as well. I'll talk a bit about why they're there. Solvay. One of the largest soda ash companies in the world is also part of the uh, consortium. They're interested in lime and CO2 as part of the soda ash process. So it's pretty big companies uh, alongside us in both these Lilac 1 and 2 projects. Where does Lilac fit in terms of its commercial, I guess, the competitive landscape? This is a question I'm often asked. Uh, so I've decided to tabulate it here and put in place uh, where it sits compared to a few of these other technologies that are being developed in cement and lime. We have Amine, we have Lilac, we have a, a company called Sfonte developing what's called a temperature swing. Uh, calcium loopings, another technology you may have heard, and Oxyfuel. And I've rated them along this technology readiness scale. So where do they sit in terms of their readiness between one and nine? And we're not too bad. We're about five to six with our first lilac plant. Our next lilac plant should take us between seven and eight. And obviously we've got a secure development pathway there. The advantage of our technology is it's the lowest theoretical cost. It's easy electrified. It doesn't matter what energy you use. You can use electricity, biomass, hydrogen, uh, and there are no new chemicals needed. Whereas amine, while it's more technically advanced, it's much more expensive. You can see there that uh, the cost per tonne of CO2 wood is quite high. Uh, it's still a, a big project plan for Amine because it is the more technically advanced. Uh, but uh, again, if Lilac is proven at scale, it will be the lowest cost technology. So what are we going to do in terms of developing this technology? Uh, we're targeting Europe and we're targeting the US first. There's a few reasons for that. Although they're not the highest cement capacity, they've got the most support and or uh, carrots, if you like, and sticks, if you like. Uh, for CO2 emissions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. Uh, people often talk about, well, why not India or why not China? Uh, both huge cement markets, huge cement markets, but really their emissions policy and support or incentives around CO2 mitigation are not fully formed yet. So the, the target up to 2030 is to really beachhead this technology in the US and Europe. Here's the carrot and sticks I talked about. The carrot uh, in Europe is the innovation fund that will give capital support to big projects. 10 billion fund up to 2030, up to 60% contribution of capital. And the stick that they have in Europe is the price of CO2. So they're gonna be putting a price on CO2. Uh, and at the moment, that's about 25 euro per tonne. 
It used to be around five under a cap and trade mechanism, but as soon as they brought in a 2.2% year on year reduction in that cap, you've seen the price of CO2 jump in Europe quite substantially. In the States, they actually have a couple of carrots. They have a, uh, enhanced oil recovery CO2 value, and they also have a tax credit system, both of which uh, give a substantial value to CO2. So it may be a, a net positive cash flow project that would put a CO2 mitigation project into the States. Just in terms of carbon capture and storage versus utilisation, is another question we're asked. Um, in the end, because of the volumes of CO2, you're gonna have to find storage for it. You can't utilise it all. There are companies working on some utilisation options, but really storage in sequestering and underground aquifers and these sorts of things is really gonna be the way that, uh, that huge amounts of CO2 are gonna be dealt with. And this is a bit of an overview of what that looks like uh, in Europe. So uh, in Europe, there's uh, five projects there being developed for CO2 storage, uh, three in the UK, one in Norway, and one in the Port of Rotterdam. Port of Rotterdam is one of our partners on uh, the Lilac project. Uh, there's also some utilisation projects being developed in Europe. Uh, for example, Heidelberg Cement are, are doing algal projects, they're also doing cement fine CO2 absorption where old cement uh, uh, from uh, demolition sites is contacted with the CO2 to absorb it and then reused as concrete. Um, in the US, it's a different proposition. They've got a lot of pipelines there for enhanced oil recovery. So CO2 is injected into a pipeline and those pipelines then pump it underground to help with oil recovery. Uh, that, while that's a, a fairly short term play, for the, depending upon how many fossil fuels uh, and how long they last, maybe a few decades, over the longer term, the infrastructure is already there for CO2 uh, transportation, which is one of the, the key things that still have to be developed in Europe. So the United States is quite attractive uh, from a CO2 infrastructure perspective. Just in terms of the market from 2030, uh, once we've beachheaded the technology and fully developed it, we then really target China, India, Africa, South America. That's where the growth is going to be. That's where most of the uh, cement plant capacity is. And that they'll be replacing that capacity over time. Uh, and so really the market from 2030 onwards is targeting retrofit and greenfields opportunities in those markets. The other thing about the technology is it's readily electrified. As industry uh, re is required to electrify, as renewables becomes a higher and higher percentage of a grid, and obviously as fossil fuels uh, increasingly come under pressure, our technology is already there. That heat, we're heat agnostic, as I said, it can be biomass, it can be hydrogen, it can be fossil fuel, it can be electricity. And of course, uh, electricity can come from renewable sources. And Engie, who's part of the Lilac 2, are working with us on what we call a load balancing project in Lilac 2, where we look at uh, part firing on electricity part of the day and then shifting back across, say, to natural gas on another part of the day. And that can take advantage of low electricity prices, for example, when a lot of solar is pumping into the grid. And so this is of huge interest to companies like Engie. Uh, because you've got a single point source that, that saps up a lot of the, uh, the power uh, the, when, when, if there's a lot of solar coming into the grid, for example. Just in terms of other projects that we're developing in the CO2 space, cement and lime is sort of all I've talked about, uh, but there are other areas where our technology is applied for CO2 mitigation. We're developing, obviously, the, the, the magnesia part of the business. That's the part of the business that we've been in, uh, but also there's a lot of refractory uh, that is made from magnesia, and that needs to decarbonize as well. Lime, which goes into steel, pulp and paper, glass, water, etc. Lime itself is a huge emitter of CO2. And again, the core technology can play into that space. Shipping uh, is a very major emitter of CO2. We've developed a process called recast to capture CO2 emissions from ships. Uh, there's also direct air capture and baseload energy storage systems, both of which we're developing projects on. So it's not just lime and cement, there's a huge part of the technology uh, being invested into CO2 capture in these areas as well. So just in summary, I guess, uh, if you have a look at the, the CO2 opportunity that we see for our technology, there's a lot of money being invested to date. Another 27 million already secured to continue to develop the technology. Uh, cement is a massive market, 2 billion tonnes per annum of CO2. Uh, so once proven at scale, we're, as we said, we're only limited really by the speed of deployment. Uh, there are other opportunities in very large markets that are coming as well. It's a very capital light business model. We're just going for engineering services revenues and a licensing royalty type model. 
um, and at scale, uh, we're the cheapest cement and lime CO2 mitigation option. Obviously, all of this is patented protected. So we, we've updated our patents for cement and lime, uh, and so the, the intellectual property is secure. So hopefully, Simon, that uh, gives everyone a good, good insight into where we see the CO2 opportunity for, for our technology. Great. Thanks, Phil. Just a reminder to those on the line, if you do want to ask a question, just the, the Q&A box uh, is where to submit it. Uh, first question, I feel great, Prezzo. How do you contrast with a couple of the other ASX listed companies, Fluence and Sidev, or a couple I'm aware of? Uh, oh, right. So, so with Sidev, I guess Sidev, uh, we're, we're aware of. It's, it's concentrating on water treatment and water treatment services in, in mining and, and oil and those sorts of areas. Um, we're concentrating mainly on uh, wastewater and an additive for wastewater treatment. So the US business and the Australian business, for example, we're concentrating on magnesium as a specialist alkali for wastewater treatment. Uh, so I guess that that's one vertical of our business um, with, with a very, very big opportunity. Um, and so uh, uh, I guess compared to, compared to Cyber, I, I don't know how big their market opportunity is though, uh, but we don't, we don't compete against them. Uh, Simon, I guess that that's, is that the nature of the question or is it more? Of yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it's just how do we contrast with them? Yeah, yeah, no, no. So we, we don't offer uh, a service type package that, that effectively takes uh, all the wastewater from say a construction project and deal with that. We're, we're a specialist uh, sole uh, supplier of alkali uh, additive to uh, biotreater systems, sewer systems, those sorts of things. So, so we're a little different to side it. And, and just uh, a simple question here, cement and lime, uh, what, you're, what you're doing is akin to carbon capture, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Um, and in terms of actually commercialising or, or realising value within, uh, within, within this vertical, is it such that you need to go through um, our level of testing over the next you know, sort of few years to, to realise value or is there the ability to, to uh, realise value in, in other ways? Look, I think um, if I if I hark back to an earlier slide that I had in the presentation, Simon, if I, if I have a look at the strategic opportunity in this particular vertical, um, as the technology continues to de-risk, and certainly towards the end of Lilac 1, and as we move past uh, the investment decision point for Lilac 2, um, effectively the technology uh, is de-risking. Uh, and if it's de-risking and is the cheapest available technology, uh, then what that will mean is that those companies who are engineering technology companies or investors in those types of businesses, uh, we see equity opportunities there. So uh, if, uh, if uh, uh, for example, an engineering technology company wants to be the technology uh, uh, company that takes this opportunity to market, uh, there's going to be uh, potential value inflection points as they invest uh, into that business. So we're not, we're not setting ourselves up to be a builder of these types of facilities. Uh, we're just going to simply license that out. Uh, and so the value inflection point comes if, if someone wants to have a piece of that action. Uh, and as I say, as the technology de continues to de-risk, uh, then I'd be very surprised if, if there's not interest in, in taking a part of that action. Great. Next question. Uh, very good and concise presentation, Phil. Say in three to four years, once Lilac 3 is up and running, what percentage will Lilac royalty slash license fee contribute to your overall company revenues, i.e. will it be the major part of your business? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I think um, once Lilac 3 uh, starts to move ahead, uh, then there is, there is that opportunity uh, for that part of the business to really take off, if you like. Uh, we've got pretty ambitious plans for other parts of our business, certainly the water and wastewater business and the US growth opportunity is significant. Uh, but if we move to uh, five, eight years out from now, if the lilac has de-risked to where we, where we think it will, uh, then obviously that really starts to become a significant part of our business. There's a lot of companies and countries who are now putting stakes in the ground on decarbonisation by 2030. And so that thing means things have really got to start to get moving. So it, it, is a, it is a great technology to, to have right now, if you like. I think there's a lot of interest uh, really starting to be generated in CO2 mitigation uh, options and cement and lime is one of the hardest to do. So uh, I really think, yeah, five to eight years from now, I think uh, this could be a major part of the company's value. 
Uh, and you may have already covered this, Bill, but uh, it's just been submitted again. What's done with the CO2 after separation? Is it recycled? And if so, what for what purpose? Or is it sequestered? At the moment, so uh, the CO2 is, is the cement company's product, if you like. Uh, so they're doing various things with it. So uh, Heidelberg Cement, for example, are investigating growing algae. So they've got uh, an algae farm. Uh, they've got uh, recycled uh, cement finds uh, um, uh, plant set up where they're, they're looking uh, to see if they can recycle it that way. Um, ultimately, there's multiple other projects that, that various companies are looking at for CO2 utilisation. But ultimately, it needs to be stored once you actually start getting past a certain capacity or amount of CO2 being produced, you can't utilise it all. So as we see cement plants come on, you'll see uh, storage projects uh, uh, being developed and, and ultimately put into place. And, and those projects that are covered in EU, uh, the three UK projects, the Port of Rotterdam and the Northern Lights projects are all about that CO2 storage piece. So utilisation may take some of the initial CO2 that's produced, but ultimately as more and more cement plants capture their CO2, we're gonna to have to move to uh, sequestration. Awesome, thanks very much, Phil. It's always uh, one of the, the most interesting and, and multi-layered stories uh, <laughs> on the ASEC, certainly in my opinion. Um, so thanks for taking the time again uh, to present to the team, um, but uh, we'll, we'll finish it there.